What's up guys, and welcome to another episode of great 16-bit license games on Sega Systems. Now, in the first episode that I did, I only did a handful of games. There was just no way I could fit every good licensed game into one episode. So I definitely decided it had to be a series. There's gonna be multiples of these, and here are eight more games that were licenses from other properties. Now what I basically mean by a licensed game is not that it was just a third party game. I mean that it is a license that actually came from someplace else. It was a movie, it was a TV show, it was a comic book, it was from some other form of media outside of video games and the video game system got a version of it. You know, an adaptation of that property. And that's what I'm really trying to cover here. And even with the eight more you're going to see here, there are tons more we can still go over. But anyway, here are eight more great 16-bit license games. The Adventures of Batman and Robin was released in 1995 and developed by Clockwork Tortoise. This Sega published joint came late in the Genesis life and features a number of programming tricks that really show off the capabilities of the developer. Seriously, this game is a great looking showpiece for the hardware. Not only do segments show off some of the Genesis trademark multiple background layers and tons of enemies on screen, but you also get some great software scaling and rotation effects that look just spectacular on hardware that was released in 1988. The gameplay is run and gun platformer style and feels a little like Gunstar Heroes at times thanks to its fast paced and varied gameplay. The mix of melee combat and distance attacks feel good, and the charge attack is a power that must be mastered to progress deep into the game. And make no mistake, this one is hard as hell for newcomers. The first few times you play this game, it seems impossible, but a few extra rounds and you'll start to see the strategies you'll need to succeed. The game also has some shoot 'em up stages to break up the run and gun action with even these sporting some kick-ass effects that look great. I hadn't played this one in a long time, and man did it kick my ass during the capturing process. It's a great old school challenge, and completely different from the Game Gear, Sega CD, and Super Nintendo games. If I had to pick out a weakness, I'd say the soundtrack isn't the greatest at times. A few of the tracks sound really good, but much of it has that hard edge western style synth that plagued the later Genesis releases. Outside of that though, this one is a challenging, good looking and good playing Batman adventure. A complete copy is hard to find in good condition thanks to the crappy paper boxes of later Genesis games, but I've seen them go around $50 or so, which isn't a terrible price at all for a game of this caliber. The Probe software developed and Arena published Alien 3 hit in late 1992. Based on the movie of the same name, you guide Ripley through 20 stages of alien infested action. The main goal in this fast paced run and gun platformer is to rescue your fellow inmates who have all been captured and held prisoner. There is a time limit in place that pushes you through and the sprawling, labyrinth-like levels are chock full of enemies that literally pop out of the ground in front of you. Memorizing the layouts is key to getting through the areas alive, as you can't leave a single prisoner behind in the vast majority of the game. The exit only opens once you have them all, and you'll need some dedication to do it. The level design shines thanks to the exploration needed to move deeper into the game. You simply can't run past everything and blow through it. It even has a nice claustrophobic feel that every Aliens game needs to be authentic. It's nothing special graphically, but does have some nice animation for some of the characters. The music isn't bad either, with only its repetition across multiple stages being somewhat of a weakness. Despite the game's quality, a complete inbox find will usually be quite affordable at around $20. That makes this one well worth picking up.
Konami was always strong with its licensed games backed in the 8 and 16-bit era, so I went into Animaniacs for the Genesis thinking this was going to be a Mario-style platformer of the highest quality. Released in 1994, this one is more like the Lost Vikings than anything else. You guide the three main characters from the TV show through puzzle-like levels. Each character has one or two special abilities that must be utilized at the proper time to be successful and move on. There's tons of platforming around the puzzles, and that platforming makes up the bulk of the game's challenge. It's a nice looking experience, with great animation and color. I especially like how everything mimics the animated series, right down to the music. This is a great one to play with your kids, and has a password system to get you back to the level you left off on. In the grand scheme of Konami releases on the 16-bit Genesis, Animaniacs may be seen as one of their weaker efforts. I'll agree it isn't at the same level of, say, Contra Hardcore or Castlevania Bloodlines, but this one can be had for $20 or less complete most of the time, making it more than good enough for those seeking something a little different than your run-of-the-mill platformer. I'm not a big fan of Sega of America published 16-bit titles, but 1993's Dinosaurs for Hire is a big exception. Based on the satirical comic released in the 1980s, you take control of one of three dinosaurs in a run-and-gun action game that plays similar to games like Contra. It's platform heavy and can spike in difficulty out of the blue, but I really dig its pace and responsive control. Power-ups and food are littered throughout the stages, giving you a good reason to explore some of the larger areas. The graphics and sound here are nothing to write home about, though it doesn't detract from the experience either. There isn't a lot of color in use compared to some of the Genesis later efforts, and the soundtrack seems like it should be fast-paced and hard-hitting, yet sounds more reserved and subdued than other running guns. The replay value is the real draw for this one, mainly because it's super easy to get into, and you know exactly what you're supposed to do. It's one of those pick up and play games that can hook you based on the strength of its gameplay alone. Shockingly, this is still under the radar of most Genesis buyers on eBay, and a complete copy goes for as little as $30 at times. It was never released in Japan or Europe, and it's true there are better running guns on the Genesis, but that doesn't take anything away from the fact that this one is still very much worth your time. Out of left field comes Taito's 1993 release, The Flintstones. I saw this on store shelves and online for years and never gave it a second look. I mean, how good could it be? It's a freaking licensed Flintstones game after all. But you know what? It's actually a damn decent platformer. It looks great too, sporting fantastic color and animation. The gameplay isn't going to win any awards for originality with its simple level design and straightforward objectives. But what's here plays smooth and responsive and gets the job done. Vehicles, animal power-ups, and level hazards like swimming stages break up the simplicity a bit. And though the overall experience isn't extremely challenging, it is long enough to give you some bang for your buck. The lone area of weakness is the soundtrack, which is repetitive and unappealing to my taste. It's also getting expensive these days, with complete inbox copies going for $40 or more. If you can find it on the cheap, or just want to fire it up on your EverDrive, this is a fun and strong playing platformer that has enough going for it to satisfy even the most discriminating fan of the genre. Just be sure to turn the volume down a bit. In 
1993 would also give us the Vic Tokai published Amazing Saga Mutant Fighter, developed by Almanac. Based on the popular Japanese comic series, this beat-em-up fighting game hybrid is a surprisingly solid effort. I had no experience with the universe until this game, but the story is exactly what you'd expect. Some dude named God Kaiser Hell shows up, whoops our asses, and only one guy is capable of saving the day. Oh yeah, and don't forget the giant robots. The gameplay here is extremely simple, with a basic attack, a special attack, and a jump making up the majority of the gameplay presentation. Once you battle your way through each stage, a boss battle is awaiting you in the form of a one-on-one -on -one fighting game. The controls here are simple as well, but each enemy has a special attack that must be either blocked or avoided to defeat them. This adds a layer of depth to the game, with each battle representing a different strategy needed to defeat your foe. The graphics here are rather simple most of the time, particularly the small sprites and simple foreground detail. Everything is animated well, however, and the variety in environments really helps. Once things switch over to your one-on-one -on -one battles, the large, colorful characters look great, and I really love the lying scrolling floor in the background. The sound and music is perhaps the area that many of you will be mixed on, with some of you loving the fast pace of the soundtrack and others hating the repetitive tempos. Either way, I recommend firing this up on your EverDrive and giving it a go, and if you're into collecting for the Genesis, expect this one to go around $100 complete in box. Sculptured Software would develop the Genesis home adaptation of the mega-popular Capcom arcade beat-em-up, The Punisher, released in late 1994. I can't tell you how excited I was that this one was coming home to Sega's 16-bit system, but alas, the meager 16-meg cartridge was no match for the arcade version. Everything about this release is scaled back heavily. The sprites are smaller, there are less enemies on screen, the background detail has been dialed way back, and there is much less enemy variety. So do I recommend that you pass this one by and never look back? Absolutely not. This game still captures the fun and appeal of the arcade version. The beat-em-up gameplay is fast and fun, with mixed-in gunplay to give you some variety. Though the graphics have been scaled back heavily, they still look good for a console released in 1988. I even love the soundtrack here, with a number of entries worth listening to on their own. It's not Streets of Rage good, but lends enough atmosphere and emotion to the game to make it a worthwhile addition. This would be the only version of the Punisher arcade game ever released on a home system, and it'll likely stay that way with the comic license now out of Capcom's hands. Because of the late release of the title in the system's life, few copies were made. That has pushed this one strictly into collector's territory on pricing, easily commanding over $100 at the best of times. Given the rarity of the game, and the fact it's the only home version available, it does make it a tempting pickup. For the rest of you guys who just want to give it a try, fire it up on your favorite Genesis emulator and give it a go. It's well worth your time, and a great primer for the awesome arcade version down the road. Our last game is a 1993 release by Konami, Tiny Toon Adventures, Buster's Hidden Treasure. Konami set out to make a Sonic the Hedgehog clone to appeal to the rabid Sega fanbase, and for the most part, they succeeded. 
It's fast, colorful, well animated, and extremely easy to pick up and play for people of all ages and skill levels. You get rid of enemies by jumping on their head, and collect carrots for special items. The gameplay is platform heavy, and relies on only one button to play, again similar to Sonic. Even the boss battles mimic Sonic, with your nemesis requiring a series of bounces on the head to defeat. There is an overworld map similar to Super Mario World, where you can navigate to the various stages of the game. Hell, even the music here is decent, with a near perfect rendition of the TV show's theme song. There just isn't a lot bad to say about this one. It does exactly what you want an easy to play platformer to do. My daughter picked it up and was enjoying it in seconds, a testament to the appeal to the game's target audience. The best part is, is not only does the game look good, play and sound great, but it also is as cheap as good Genesis games come. I've seen this one go for a mere tenner at times in the states, and even on the high side it's rarely more than 20 bucks complete. It's good, simple, and easy to get into fun, and at those prices, it should be in everyone's collection. <laughs> Alright guys, there we go, 8 more great licensed 16-bit games. Now, in the first episode that I did on this subject, I got a bunch of people saying, why wasn't this game in there, or why wasn't that game in there? Guys, these episodes that I make, they are never ever meant to be one-offs. I have a finite amount of time, this is the way I choose to do it, I take little chunks on these subjects and I make little videos that include the games I want to talk about at that particular time. I never ever make content as just one-offs, you know, where this is the de facto answer or standard or group of games for this subject. I don't operate that way. If I covered every single licensed Genesis game that was worth playing, Jesus, the episode would be an hour long and it'd take me three months to make it. You know, and I don't want to make content like that. So if you didn't see a game that you think that should have been here and it wasn't, don't worry, I'll likely cover it in the future. As a matter of fact, hit me down in the comments and let me know the games you would like to see on this very subject. Either way, I'm SegalordX. X. Thank you guys for watching. I'll catch you next time.